I make reproductions of antique furniture. I try to be as realistic looking as possible. Just about everything that's made in full size is made in miniature by someone somewhere in the world. I put Gustav Baumann up against any craftsman of the 20th century. He put the work of the hand ahead of everything. The first time you see one of the Baumann marionettes, you say, oh my God, how did he make this? Just a slight pull of the string and you can change the emotion. Alexander Gerard had a hand in placing every object. He was creating these marvelous, miniature, imagined worlds. His vision was to evoke common humanity. The International Folk Art Market brings folk artists from all over the world here to Santa Fe, people who are trying to perpetuate centuries-old traditions. And we're trying to help them to bring their art forward to the world. Because of his ability to depict these vehicles, Leandro is showing us everyday life in Cuba. Mis sueños han hecho realidad, haciendo lo que me hace feliz, hacer carro. Major funding for Craft in America was provided by Cynthia Lovelace Sears. Lillian Pearson Lovelace, L.L. Brownray, National Endowment for the Arts. Additional support was provided by the following. In Santa Fe, people are really attracted to festivals. There's lots of music festivals and every year. There's an Indian market, there's Spanish market. So in 2004, the idea of an international folk art market caught fire, I guess, uh, in a good way. The International Folk Art Market brings together folk artists from all over the world. And one of the things we find is that artists make things that they see, and often they work with smaller pieces. Miniatures can be fun and compelling. And these artists want to do something that brings pleasure. Yo lo que me gusta representar mucho es la cultura popular mexicana y a veces me encanta hacerlo con movimiento mecánico. Mi trabajo son piezas de papel, cartón, pero también utilizo poquito lo que viene siendo madera y arcilla. Yo soy muy fan del pan. Yo tengo una adicción al pan, pan mexicano. Aquí tenemos lo que viene siendo la dona, lo que viene siendo el pan de muerto, la concha, que es un pan muy icónico de México. Y el movimiento es, es simple también porque para mí es nada más la representación de un, de un vendedor. La idea principal cuando yo trabajé, pues que son juguetes que eran dirigidos para niños. Se, se les hace muy entretenido, tanto para niños, pero también como los adultos, porque saciaba como el niño interior que tenemos nosotros. Es la tercera vez que he estado aquí en IFAM. La verdad, es muy, se me ha hecho muy importante participar. Cuando creo estas piezas, es una visión de mi mundo. We're trying to not only help them find a platform to bring their art forward to the world, but also create a community of international understanding. We have this amazing community welcome. 
the artists process around our historic plaza, everybody in their national dress. Please welcome Mexico! Each of the country groups comes up together. We just really have a celebration. The artists are really revered, and I think this is what world peace looks like. We are from Kyrgyzstan. My mom makes felt dolls. And we are very excited to be here, um, meet our old friends, our old customers, and see new people. Kırgızistan <gülüyor> These are people who are trying to perpetuate centuries-old traditions. They're trying to figure out how to convince the younger generation to work with the handmade. Yo inicié este trabajo a los 11 años, el tallado completamente, y he trabajado piezas muy pequeñas, miniaturas. <laughs> proceso utilizando madera y pintura acrílica. En la pintura implementamos mucho historias de lo que hay en murales de prehispánicos. Entonces, en mi trabajo puede encontrar tanto figuras este como jaguares, como personajes este indígenas. Mi esposa y yo estamos enseñando tanto jóvenes de la comunidad como a nuestros propios hijos para que esta herencia de, de nuestro arte siga por más generaciones. It's such a privilege to be able to travel the world in one place, you know, and get to know all the beauty of so many cultures. It's needed so much in this moment in a world that standardizes everything. Perhaps through art, we can break walls of race and walls of prejudice. Traemos la cultura de Perú a través de los retablos con temas religiosos, costumbristas, históricos, temas sociales actuales como del problema de virus de COVID en estos. Historia de los retablos viene de España, pero sí ahora tiene un mensaje comunicativo es de la lucha social del Perú. Hay una interpretación, es el mensaje de cada retablo. Por ejemplo, como en este caso, es una elaboración taller de corazones, donde que una persona lo califica con amor, con ilusión, corazón, pero también hay corazones de rupturas. Para hacer los retablos utilizamos los materiales, la papa como básico, utilizamos la harina industrial, esa mezcla, esa pasta, reforzamos con alambre, utilizamos pinturas acrílicas, combinación con placera, el barniz. Y las miniaturas hacemos especialmente de las cajitas de fósforo, hacemos en, los, en las cáscaras de huevo, en las pequeñas cositas. Mi padre Florentino Jiménez fue uno de los grandes retablistas. Nosotros hemos sido los primeros los que damos el ejemplo del mensaje de las cosas pequeñas en el Perú. You know, the most amazing thing are the stories we hear about what happens when the artists go back home with their earnings here. 
they might pay their own school fees for their children. They might buy a washing machine. In other cases, it could be dramatic. It's a very big help for us, especially for now, when we are in a war and for now, 90% of working place are lost in Ukraine. So you can imagine, what does it mean? At the beginning, I in, even I couldn't, I couldn't do my work. I couldn't do embroidery. I just was like hoping that maybe the war will stop, but it's keep going and going and going. So I start to do my textile again. So it's like art for survive, I would say. We're in the booth of Leandro Gomez Quintero. He lives in Baracoa, which is the northeastern part of the island of Cuba. Leandro was a history teacher, and he was teaching about World War II. So he started creating these models. And then somebody suggested, why don't you make the vehicles that we use around here? And he uses everything. The cover of a toothpaste tube becomes a hubcap. This year, Leandro couldn't get a visa and come to the folk art market from Cuba. My wife Peggy and I are here to visit Leandro Gomez. Baracoa is very isolated. It really can only be reached by this road called La Farola. La Farola was built after the revolution. Before that, the only way to reach Baracoa was by boat. I grew up in Cuba, and then my family moved to New York when I was 12. My father spent time in this town of Baracoa during World War II, and he always told me that this was the most beautiful place in Cuba. Leandro lives across the street from the seawall, so the ocean is right there. His wife is a doctor, and they have two kids. Yo nací aquí en Baracoa en el año 1976 y siempre he vivido en esta misma casa y me crié aquí en el mismo barrio. Leandro, oye, ¿cómo no, estás? No, pero sí, hermano. ¿Cómo estás? <risa> oye. <laughs> the first time I saw Leandro's work, I was here without Stuart in 2014. And I wanted to get him something special. And I walked into a gallery and there was this red Jeep on a pedestal. I said, oh, this is amazing. So I took it back home to Stuart and he said, well, next time I'm going with you. <laughs> <laughs> and we hit it off immediately because he's a car guy and I'm sort of a car guy. I have a Jeep myself. Yo soy profesor de filosofía e historia, pero yo abandoné el trabajo y dije me voy a dedicar Por completo, por completo, a hacer carro. O sea, yo decía, voy a jugármelo todo, voy a ser feliz haciendo lo que me hace feliz hacer. Just as a painter paints a landscape that he sees, he creates these sculptures based on these vehicles that he sees, and then he adds his own creativity to them. Si te carga madera para hacer muebles, Saco con vianda, el chofer trae para la casa para comer. <laughs> Los carros cuentan la historia porque forman parte de la historia. Este particularmente, el general Dwight Eisenhower dijo que el Willy Jeep había sido una de las mayores contribuciones del ejército norteamericano a la Segunda Guerra Mundial. El Jeep Willy entró en Cuba por la, la base naval de Guantánamo y el lote que se vendían a la población. 
Y enséñame cómo es esto, cómo tú haces estas cosas. Estudio en, en sus componentes para después entonces saber cómo armarlo yo. Mi materia prima básica y fundamental es el cartón. Por eso es que son tan ligeros los modelos, porque es cartón. Él está hecho al detalle en cuanto a las proporciones del car básicas del original. El chasis, el diferencial, la caja de velocidad, el tubo de escape. Ellos transportan varias cosas que las personas tengan para transportar. Esto puede ser un saco con alimento. Esto es parte de un techo de una casa que posiblemente el hombre está armando. Estas son maderas para hacer que las personas transportan mucho. Because of his ability to depict these vehicles as uh, realistically as possible, he's showing us everyday life in Cuba. American cars stopped coming into Cuba at the end of 1959. But Cubans have done an incredible job of making these cars survive. Oye, Gallego. Ah. ¿Cómo está todo? Bueno, ya tú sabes. Ay, caramba. Cada día mejor. ¿Qué cosa más linda tú tienes aquí, chico? Este carro fue de mi abuelo, un Willy del año 1952. Muy noble, un carro muy noble, muy fuerte. Ah, tiene el motor original, tiene muchas piezas y partes originales. ¿Esto? También, sí. Esa es la bomba de gasolina. La bomba de gasolina. Esto es el filtro. Esta pieza original también. Todo es original. Esto original, original. Y a los nueve años aprendí a conducirlo cuando apenas alcanzaba el timón. ¿El tapaplano original gallego? Sí. Lo he restaurado tal y como lo fabricaron. Allá vamos. Yo recuerdo, yo era muchacho, tendría nueve, diez años, y ver en las noches la silueta del Willy que pasaba por la calle, solo alumbrado con, con la luna. Y yo decía, yo amo ese carro, adoro esa forma, esa silueta. Era como, como una novia, como una muchacha que me encantaba. Yo en ocasiones me pregunto, ¿qué haría yo en otro país, en otro lugar, con mucho más recursos? Pero entonces digo, no sería mi trabajo igual. Los dueños de los carros en Cuba, si no tienen la pieza de fábrica ideal, le ponen la pieza que tienen o la pieza que encuentran. Si no tienen la pintura ideal, le ponen la pintura que tienen. Me pasa a mí también. Entonces utilizo también el fango como si hubieran transitado por un camino. Leandro follows the Cuban methodology of resolving or as they say, resolver. If you don't have something, you just find some other way to make it work. And so he carves tires out of packing styrofoam that people throw away. Entonces yo simplemente voy, la recojo y le doy una segunda oportunidad. Yo reciclo o recojo materiales que me encuentro en la calle. Las personas decían, tiene problemas, ¿qué le pasa a él que recoja basura? Es just amazing to me that he finds these materials and he makes a complete work of art. Para mí esto es oro. Yo lo pico y amarrarla, ponerla aquí. 
en la lona del carro que lo tapa. Porque así ocurre en la vida real en Maracó. Yo nunca me imaginé la magnitud que iba a tener el huracán Mati. El mar entraba a la casa con una normalidad, entraba por una puerta y salía por la otra en la otra caída. Cuando el ojo pasó por, por aquí, pudimos escapar de la casa. Al amanecer, los ojos de la gente mirando lo que había quedado, ¿no? lo indecible, pertenencia de las personas regadas por donde quieren en toda la calle, puertas, persianas, de todo. Solo me quedaron las cuatro paredes, todo lo demás lo perdí. Peggy and I came here uh, right after Hurricane Matthew, and we were the first tourists that came back to Baracoa. Y recuerdo que en la, en la conversación salió eso. Si vas al mercado de arte, tienes la posibilidad de reconstruir tu casa. We helped him apply to the market and he was accepted. He raised enough money to rebuild the back of the house. Entonces concreto, sólido. And it will probably withstand another hurricane. Gracias al mercado. Con, okay. con aire acondicionado. Con aire acondicionado. <risa> Tú, Ari me cambiaron la vida por completo. Cambiaron mi vida totalmente. Yo fui tocado. Entonces hacemos amarillo y gris lo detalle, con la bujía, todas las cositas. Esa batería te quedó buena. Esa batería está buena ahí. Gracias, Alejandro. Eh, trabajo aquí hace cinco años. Y a este se le pudiera hacer la tapa del motor. Me ha enseñado mucho en la técnica del trabajo. Cada día lo hacemos con más calidad y con más perfección. Yo todas las noches me digo, ¿qué tú haces? ¿Por qué tú no vas a clase? Y bueno, porque yo me decidí por hacer estos objetos de, de cartón y de reciclaje y a la vez enseñarle a las personas que trabajan conmigo para que esta, esta herencia quede, hacer esto. very serious about his work. When people see the work, they want to know more about Cuba. I thought I was going to die like that, a young irresponsible pero mis sueños se han hecho realidad. Tengo mi familia al lado. Está bien. Tengo un trabajo que, que me gratifica. Está bien. Hago lo que quiero hacer. Está bien. Yo ni siquiera tengo carro. No he podido comprarme un carro porque realmente cuesta mucho. Pero que tengo una bicicleta. Quizá algún día pueda. Me compraría un Willy. People have always been fascinated with miniature objects. There's people that work in ceramics. There's needle workers. There's glass blowers. There's jewelers. There's people that make food. Just about everything that's made in full size is made in miniature by someone somewhere in the world.
I work with wood and I make miniature furniture. The pieces that I do are generally reproductions of antique furniture. I usually work from books, antique magazines, or auction house catalogs. I try to recreate things to be as realistic looking as possible. I work in 112 scale, which is one inch to the foot, so that my furniture will fit into scale rooms. Mark does a lot of different styles that not many other people do. He does a lot of Japanese furniture, and he does a lot of the mission style. The quality of the work is precise and delicate and phenomenal. I'm making the Bowback Windsor chair. I've done close to 200 of these now. You can't do it on a regular lathe. The lathes that I use, I, I get from a jewelry supply company. You can make all the parts separate before you start assembling anything. I drill all the holes, the corresponding holes for all the spindles and the legs and the bow back piece in the back. Then I start carving the seat. I fit all the spindles in place and fit the bow back piece in place. Then you can glue all those pieces in the seat itself so you have a completed upper section of the chair. And then the leg structure is all attached to that. So basically these are made exactly like a real chair would be made. It's just a smaller scale than full-size woodworking. I grew up in Cincinnati. I'm the second oldest of seven kids. I've always loved nature, so I was always walking a lot. Let's go this way. But most of my family was actually into sports. My father was an NBA basketball referee. So while the other folks in the family were out playing basketball, I was in the basement making something, making some kind of mess. I went to the Philadelphia College of Art, now the University of the Arts. I studied woodworking and furniture design. And then shortly after I graduated, I moved to the Bay Area. I started working at a place that made all the little cars and trees for architectural models. That's where I met Pam Troop. She'd come into shop for supplies for her scale houses. And she was really my mentor. She was building houses, and so I was making some furniture pieces to go inside of them. That's what got me started in miniatures. This is the bulk of my collection in here. So this is one of my Queen Anne chairs that is upholstered with some cruel work done by Pat Richards. The white background, that is the actual fabric. And then Pat stitched on separate threads to create flowers and creatures. I live in New York City and Mark's in Oregon, but he'll uh, sometimes send me a piece of furniture that he's finished. I'll make cushions for him. I base things on historic pieces but with cool work. You do have to fill in all the details by eye, so you truly are painting with thread. The original of this pie boy is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. So this is uh, japanned, which is a process of painting um, gold and silver paints on top of black. This is a collaboration that I did with Mary O'Brien. 
she does all the painting on it. We've been working for over 20 years together. He makes furniture, he likes tools. I prefer the paintbrush, so we match up well. It's country painting style with lots of brush strokes. And the door is open, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, they all do. They have to kind of tip them a little bit to get them all up. My late partner used to do these um, miniature pastels. This is just like the beautiful landscapes where we went hiking a lot. I started teaching in 2000 at the International Guild of Miniature Artisans. They've been doing that school for 40 years in this small town called Castine in Maine. It was the first time I had ever taught anything. That's when I really found my art family. I never felt so appreciated. He's a great teacher. So patient with all the students' different learning processes. So Guild School is our, our brigadoon. It blossoms once every June, and when we're done, it closes and goes away till the next year. In making miniature furniture, it's really nice to have the actual object in front of you, which I have done with several of my own pieces. So this is a piece of Japanese furniture that I own that I recreated in, in miniature. And Mary O'Brien painted the panels. And there's a little slot underneath here for, for your finger that you don't see to open the door. So there's no handles. I did the same thing on this, but it's really tiny. So you just go in with the tweezers or something to open the door. In Chicago, we have probably the biggest miniature show in the world. People come from all over the world to buy and to sell there. The fascination with miniatures, I think it's because you create an environment that maybe you can't afford in real life, but that you could do in miniature. This is one that just has a more of a floral pattern. Right. Most of us are working at home quietly alone and a few times a year. We come to the shows to connect with customers. The show's been very good, yeah. Mark has been a wonderful artisan for as long as I've been collecting. And I, I have many, many pieces of his throughout the museum. You know, I need to talk to you about a new project. Okay. So let's think about what we're gonna do. Um, something Kentucky. Okay. Something yeah. Kentucky. Well, give me some information about things you like and we'll, okay. we'll find some things okay. that we both like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here with my colleagues that I work with, my needlework friends. <laughs> when we get together here or up at school, it's old home week. We come from all over, but it has become a community. This is our newest piece, and I put the background colors on, and then I send it to Mary, and she does all the decorative painting on top of that. Do you do it under a mic like a mic? I wear goggles. goggles. And they're getting yeah. stronger and stronger. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful yes. work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we get our we get on you. <laughs> One thing that was special this year is some of my family came up to join me. The color is beautiful. I like this color too. This is more, I do too. more I like teal. That too. Yeah. 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 We're so proud of him. He's in his element. He that is, is for sure. Yes. Seeing him in his yeah. element is wonderful. Talking about his pieces and what made him think of the colors to use, and it's been very interesting to watch his side of what his business, what he does. And, you know, makes me a little perquimped because, I mean, that's my cousin, and he is, he is amazing. The 
The Museum of International Folk Art in Santa Fe opened in 1953. It is full of marvelous, miniature, imagined worlds. The term folk art in many people's minds is kind of a diminishment, and that's not at all how we feel about it. It's masterful work um, by people who excel in their craft. In 1982, we opened the exhibition Multiple Visions, A Common Bond, which is a show with over 10,000 objects, all gifted to the museum by Alexander Gerard. Alexander Gerard grew up in Italy, uh, outside of Florence in a villa. And in 1932, he had come to the United States. And he was wandering around, he told me, in Greenwich Village, and he suddenly saw this spatter-painted clay bank from Mexico. It transformed his life, actually. It just made him realize he had to have more of this, and he had to understand what were the motivations uh, and meaning of folk art. He was a very well-known mid-century designer. He became the head of the textile division at Herman Miller, the furniture company. He injected color and pattern and texture, bringing a little more joy to modern design. He could do his job anywhere. So in 1953, he and his wife, Susan, moved to Santa Fe, but they had already started their voracious collecting of both toys and folk art, which ultimately reached 106,000 objects. In October of 1978, many, many beer boxes that look like this um, arrived here at the museum. This was box 3,837, plus hundreds of crates for the larger items. And those were all stored in the auditorium. I was the curatorial coordinator. And as we were unpacking this collection, a lot of which he hadn't seen since he packed it, the joy that Mr. Gerard felt was palpable. He was just having the greatest time. It took over two years with the help of cultural and advisors, 30 volunteers and the entire staff to build this installation. Alexander Gerard designed and curated. He had a hand in placing every object. He created what he called sets. They're kind of these villages in miniature. This is the 40th anniversary of the collection being on display exactly as he created it. So this set is a miniature representation of an actual town in Mexico called Acatlan de Osorio. Miniatures are, are a really popular and rich tradition in Mexico. Alexander Gerard would buy lots of these ceramic figures. And then he would animate the whole set by having them interact with each other. He would layer and layer. He would add more things to the back. He would, you know, he just, uh, he definitely had a vision in his mind. He often referred to these figurative ceramics as people because they were people who were inhabiting this scene. The Puebla kitchen set represents miniatures of all different types that are made in Mexico. And so you've got the straw work, metal work, and ceramic dishes that are so tiny you can't imagine how the person made them. He told me that he was in a small Mexican village and he discovered these clay cacti. He said, I want more of these. So he returned and he said, no, I mean, I really want more of these. <laughs> The, the field stopped being plowed. I mean, the whole village was put to work making cacti for this American folk art collector. Whereas many of the villages that Gerard created in Multiple Visions were specific to a country or a culture, this one, the Grand Canale, also known as the harbor scene, is really kind of a mashup. So we've got European and Asian towns on either side of the harbor. Um, the, the waterway is actually created out of shower glass. And there are in this set, both toys and folk art mixed together. 
Mr. Gerard did not drive. So every morning, I would pick him up after breakfast and then also drive him home after his afternoon work. One day he said to me, would you mind taking me to Kmart? <laughs> and I thought, okay. And he, he made a beeline right to the toy department. Uh, he bought a ape. Then he went to the pet department and bought a cage into which he placed the ape. I just realized this is a man who is so visual he has no blinders on. The circus set is mostly manufactured toys and antique ones. Alexander Gerard designed the exhibition to be an experience of discovery. There's no object labels. He didn't want labels. He wanted people to bring their own interpretation to it. Mr. Gerard grew up in an Italian villa, and this is an autobiographical set. There are pieces that were made by his brother, actually a well-known Italian ceramic artist. And then within the house, some beautiful watercolors by his good friend, Georgia O'Keeffe. This set is known as christening. It is this gathering of people to witness this momentous occasion. The space looks much deeper than it actually is because Gerard used diminishing sized figures as you went back. I think it does express in a beautiful way his vision for the whole gallery, which is to evoke common humanity. And his guiding principle was an Italian saying, tutto il mondo è paese, which to him meant all the world is hometown. It was part of his plan to stop visitors in their tracks and you know make them really look. But he also said time and time again to me, we want to have so much stuff in here that people will always have a reason to come back. And I, I do want to say after 40 years, I still find things in this gallery <laughs> that I hadn't noticed before. Santa Fe is many things to many people. I was among those that liked it, and now with the passing of years, I have found no place I like better. This is Gus Bauman speaking. Gus Bauman took inspiration from so many aspects of life and art in Santa Fe in the Southwest. He was amazingly prolific. I don't know where he found the time really to do everything. He made woodblock prints. He made furniture. And then he created these incredible marionettes. He brought a lot of beauty into a lot of people's lives and left a lasting legacy in Santa Fe. Gustav Bauman was born in Germany in 1881. Uh, his family moved to Chicago in 1891, so he was 10 years old. At the age of 16, his father abandoned the family, so Gus went to work. He started in an engraving company back before photography had worked its way into commercial printing, so images were still being carved by hand. He really learned his craft. Bauman heard about Nashville, Indiana, that there were other artists living there, and so he gave up commercial art and then moved there in 1910. Brown County, Indiana, was just emerging from the log cabin period and holding on to the old ways. The artists that lived there did so because it was an inexpensive and colorful place to work.
Gustav Baumann arrived in New Mexico in 1918. He was lured to come to Santa Fe by the curator Paul Walter here at the museum. Baumann was running short of funds, and so Paul Walter was able to secure a loan of $500. Uh, Walter being an officer of the nearby bank. There were opportunities to exhibit at the new museum, and I think for him as a young artist, it was just a perfect environment. Santa Fe was a rough and tumble town, about 7,000 residents, with a large population of Hispano peoples. Most of the Pueblo peoples were still on their original homelands outside of Santa Fe. Here we have the Anglo frontier mingling with the Spanish heritage, both together functioning side by side with the original Indian inhabitants. Folk art and handicraft flourished. There's something in the mind of man that moves his hand to creative endeavor beyond the needs of livelihood. We're in a reproduction of Gustav Baumann's studio. It's filled with actual things that he used to create his woodcut prints. He has all these pigments labeled. We have his varnishes and the oil that he used. This he would grind colors in. The block that I'll be printing is an image of his Canyon Road studio, carved in 1919. He put the work of the hand ahead of everything. So there's this sort of integrity to the craft. His process really starts with going out in nature and doing a drawing, turning it into a tempera painting. And then from that, he would carve his series of blocks. Southwest has many surprises in store for the artist in search of inspirational material. It will produce almost any kind of subject matter you might ask for. Basic forms and color combinations that we like to think of as being exclusively modern have been here for a long time waiting only to be recognized. He had his house built in Santa Fe. Everything inside is either carved or painted by Bauman. In fact, he said, I am a craftsman by choice and an artist by accident. He met Jane at a Pueblo Indian dance on Christmas Eve. She was an actress. She was interested in creativity. He was an artist. They married, settled in the house, and eventually had one daughter, Anne. He was trying to create something that would interest his daughter and entertain her, and that was these marionettes. The stage was there in the living room, and the marionettes hung uh, on a rack behind. You had the physical presence 24 hours a day of that stage and the marionettes. I love the Commedia dell'arte ones, Piero and Boom Boom the Clown, I liked him. When I was growing up at Christmas time, we had the Christmas shows, which took over the whole house. The marionette show was intended to amuse Anne and her friends, but it quickly morphed into a public show here at the museum in 1932. Jane was one of the lead puppeteers, and it was something of an annual event, and it really did draw the community together. Gustav and Jane Bauman continued the performances until 1959, and it was the Ann Bauman Trust that ultimately gave the marionettes to this museum. I can't explain what it's like the first time you see one of his puppets. You know, just that, oh my God, how did he make this? 
they're incredible. There are 76 marionettes. They were in terrible condition, which for a conservator who loves marionettes is really wonderful. I couldn't wait to work on them. I'm repairing the leg. All the joints in the legs and the arms were made out of leather. And since the puppets are about 100 years old, sometimes they'll be hanging from the rack and, you know, a leg will drop off. The leather has to be replaced. This puppet is the tourist lady, Lulu Clarkson. She's got the little camera that he handmade for her and the visor. She's always in search of a bathroom and can never find one. And you can tell by her eyes. <laughs> Bauman made each one have a real unique personality. One of the first I worked on was Paint the Horse, who goes with Pecos Bill. The horse was in many, many pieces. That was a good challenge. There's duendes, New Mexican folk elves. They're very mischievous and cause a lot of trouble. The green dragon, he's made with hoops, almost like a slinky. The fabric is suede. Several of the characters came from real people. Temperance the drunk. He was the uh, Santa Fe town drunk. Gus's wife, Jane, she's made in a really pretty silk summer dress, stockings, underwear, everything. Gus did himself as a real dandy with that Hawaiian print. And there's his daughter, Anne, when she was about five years old. It's a family portrait. And for him, that was done with marionettes. The museum will bring the marionettes out for exhibition, uh, but they're a little too fragile to perform. No, uh, it is almost time for the big welcome back party. See, I knew we were invited. So they have six puppets reproduced that are exactly like the originals. Whoa. A show's been created using the reproduction marionettes. My it was really a way to keep what had been a fantastic Santa Fe tradition alive. And we have to practice our dancing because I'm feeling... Yes, let us practice to see if we still have some of that old magic. Yes, all right. Here. Oh, 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 The children don't look up above the, the marionette on the stage. The human beings behind the marionettes cease to exist. I know. I'll put a spell on Rosina's broom so that she can't clean. The voices do start to embody um, the actual marionette, and you just kind of get transported into the world. You know, it takes a special kind of sensitivity to uh, puppeteer these puppets. It's like an extension of us. Hey, Miguelito, I'm so glad to see the both of you. I hope you have been behaving very well. Hi, Santa Nino. So you got to really watch your wrist and really figure out their little quirks. It's just a slight pull of the string and you can change the motion. Oh, I just, oh. Just a tilt of the hand, they'll go from joyous to sad. Children, should I wake them up? Yeah! Okay. Wake them up! Oh my goodness. We are actually here because of and thanks to Gustav Baumann. Through his mastery in carving the marionettes, he lives through these puppets, and therefore he lives through us. I put Bauman up against any artist craftsman of the 20th century. He was that good. He was that important. And he's still here. He's still a part of this place. If you feel that a story required a good happy ending, there it was, as good as any. And now we can all go home and I'll follow you.
Major funding for Craft in America was provided by Cynthia Lovelace Sears, Lillian Pearson Lovelace, L.L. Brownrig, National Endowment for the Arts. Additional support was provided by the following. of Craft in America online. With additional videos and more, visit Craft in America at pbs.org. This episode of Craft in America is available on Amazon Prime Video.